You know what season it is, everybody? Award season. You know what that means? Buzzwords. Revolutionary, insightful, definitive, but beyond all else, the ultimate award show buzzword is innovative. Everything is innovative now, from the innovative mind of Christopher Nolan, from the innovative creator behind PGA Tour 2K23, from the innovative homeless guy off 43rd and Park. And yet the Game of the Year award doesn't always go to the most innovative game of the year, does it? I mean, sometimes it might, provided it's got at least a little bit of popularity, but sometimes it goes to a game that simply polishes old ideas to an unbelievable shine that does a lot of things, none particularly new, but all at the peak of their powers. To some people though, it's ridiculous that something so calculated and familiar might be given the nod over something fresh and inventive. And so the question becomes, is it better to get everything right, but not do something new, or to do something new, but not not always get everything right. And the only sensible answer to that question is, wow, that's a really dumb question. To me, games like Red Dead Redemption or Dead Cells are like pizza or hamburgers. I know what a hamburger is, just like I know what a modern story-driven open world game or modern roguelite is, but there are still good hamburgers and bad hamburgers. Do you guys remember that one episode of How I Met Your Mother where they go around eating a bunch of different burgers trying to find the best one in New York? That's kind of like how playing most games is to me. Now, you could be a martial beta in this situation and be a little bit until you find the perfect one, or you can be a Ted, Barney, and Lily alpha chat and enjoy everything along the way. Or for the really daring, you could be a Robin who kept complaining that they all left before she could eat her burger, but like, it's right there, just eat it. What are you doing? Take it with you. This is not a problem. There's nothing else to play. I want to play something. I want to have fun! This is actually true. Fun fact, video games stopped being made after 2021. I look at a game and I go, I've seen this before. I know all the general ingredients. Some will throw in extra toppings or special sauces, but it's all the same thing at the end of the day, and that's okay, because it's all great. Except every once in a while, if you try enough places, you'll stumble onto something amazing. A Krabby Patty made with just the right amount of love, cooked to perfection with fresh ingredients and a swirling blend of condiments. There you go a masterpiece. And then at the next restaurant, you might go, damn, I don't want a hamburger again, because I know it's not going to be as good as the last one I had, so you order a soup. And by God, that soup transports you into another dimension of flavors and broth rivers. It's not just great because it tastes good, but it's also great because you've had 600 hamburgers in the last year. At this point, the question of which one tasted better seems kind of silly. One was the absolute peak of something that you find comfortable and have been enjoying for years, and the other was amazing partially because it wasn't what you'd become so accustomed to. There's nothing wrong with reliable, with creating something safe. I eat pizzas and hamburgers all the time, even at fancy restaurants. I could eat pizzas and hamburgers until the day I die, which, let's be honest, won't be very long if I keep eating pizza and hamburgers. And if you can create something reliable that's also at the top of its class, that's even better. As a matter of fact, these more conventional but masterful games are the ones that usually find themselves as my personal favorites. I love a good story told cinematically. I love when a game can incorporate winding levels or clever puzzles, when I can take part in an action scene that looks fancy and feels empowering. Why would I reject products that give me what I enjoy purely on the basis of it feeling like well-trodden ground? I don't need a game to change the landscape of the industry to be incredible. I know this is a shock, but if a game can deliver the stuff I like, well, hallelujah, it's a good game. That goes for anything that follows general conventions but pushes the boundaries of what they can do, like Red Dead 2's narrative or Returnal's AAA approach to roguelikes. It goes for games that do their part in matching the quality of the greats before it, while not necessarily breaking new ground like Tunic's brilliant unguided exploration. And it even goes for games that that don't match the best of the best, but have a unique spin or enjoyable concept regardless with a nice little drop of good old fashioned passion. A game like Solar Ash, a game like Blasphemous, I would argue a game like Horizon, and even a game like Spider-Man. It's got a great story and visuals and gameplay, but you could find tons of games that do each of those things better, and its general structure is not exactly new. That said, it's Spider-Man, and it's one of my favorite games ever because it's everything that I like done pretty damn well, and in case you missed it, it's Spider-Man. This game is important even if it's not a trendsetter. I also find that with a more focused mindset, a dedication to mastering ideas over introducing them, developers are able to protect their game a little bit from the inevitable passage of time. The original God of War, which expanded on the ideas of other hack and slashers before it, actually feels pretty solid to play today. Maybe not to the levels of a modern game, and some elements like its dodge feel pretty sluggish, but compared to more innovative titles like Shadow of the Colossus, it handles like a dream. The latter feels incredibly unwieldy, and you're constantly wrestling with the controls, and the physics can get really wonky. It's a certified classic, but it stands out more conceptually and for what it did at the time. And unlike something with more
more standardized practices like God of War, it had a much quicker expiry date despite coming out in the same year. Even its remake plays very outdated. This is something I've noticed with a lot of influential titles. Their arrival on the scene is so spectacular and the games they spawn continue to improve on their novel concepts, but being the first one out of the gate means it's riddled with a lot of issues that become bigger problems once their influence has actually settled. You would totally expect this out of games that came out during the genesis of the medium or even a little bit later with stuff like Doom or Metal Gear Solid, which sparked new genres but had horribly laid out levels or frustrating controls. They're older, they were figuring stuff out and were creating a whole new type of game. It's easy to excuse, but what about Bioshock? This is another one of my favorite games ever. It's considered very innovative and it has so many great ideas that still stand out today. It even has gunplay that's held up pretty well in my opinion, but it's older sound design and mixing trips over itself and muddies the atmosphere that it's so well known for, which is something that I never really noticed when I first played it. And the last stretch of that game is concentrated pain in video game form. It's legit terrible. The drop in quality is jarring. A lot of these experimental games always feel like at some point they hit a wall or fall off the rails. And you know what? I'm just gonna say it. Dark Souls kind of sucks. Hear me out, when this game first came out, it was incredible, or so I've been told. Personally, I was 11 years old at the time and was still trying to wrap my head around the mechanical complexities of Sonic Riders. But at this point, it's pretty tough to get into this game if you haven't already played and loved it. Dark Souls is only just over a decade old, and while its ideas sparked a dominating new genre, it's already been dismantled by the passage of time. There's like a middle point where this game is really solid, it's this point right here depending on how you play it, but before that, the areas you explore are super dry and the enemies are really basic, and after that, the game is genuinely horrible. The catacombs? Ugh. Blight Town? Pooh. Friggin' Lost Isolith and the Tomb of the Giants? Yeah, Disgusting. And even throughout the good parts, there's some head-scratching design decisions and bosses. Hell, even its most celebrated boss is sorta kinda very broken. And yet, we need Dark Souls. Dark Souls made gaming more interesting, as did Bioshock and MGS and Doom and Shadow of the Colossus. These games deserve to be celebrated and remembered, but so do the ones that managed to present themselves as timeless, who said, hey, let's take what these other guys did and just make it feel a little bit better. That's it. We're not adding too much. We're just doing a good job. History will always recognize these more, as it rightfully should, but that doesn't in any way discount iterative or adjacent projects that were still well made. Of course, some games defy all odds and manage to do both, but I could count on one hand the number of studios that pulled something like that off, and among them would be Valve and Nintendo, even ignoring all the very early work Nintendo did in basically defining what games were in the 80s. Portal deepened the interest in physics-based gameplay, Mario 64 was ground zero for 3D platformers, although even these companies sometimes needed a couple cracks at it. Half-Life 2 is still considered great today, but 1 is markedly outdated. While Valve hasn't made much over the last decade to continue that track record, modern Mario games actually highlight something very important to this discussion, considering they are constantly innovating, but not really influencing. Whether it's the gravity platforming of Galaxy or the hybridized 2D slash 3D exploration of Odyssey, the massive strides this series makes usually don't ripple into other platformers. And that's because Mario exists in a time where 3D platforming is transformed into parkour action games or shooters with platforming elements, as Ratchet and Clank or Jack and Daxter display well. There are a few stragglers left that adopt some of these ideas, like the whole becoming different objects or animals to solve platforming puzzles concept being used by Kirby and... Oh. Yeah, no, just, just Kirby. I don't think any other game tried to do that. But most platformers either went a different way a long time ago or are still working with most of the same ideas that you could find in Banjo-Kazooie. New 3D Marios don't influence the 3D platforming scene much because they're the only ones operating in the classic style while being anywhere close to this level idea-wise. So you gotta ask yourself, if a game innovates in a forest and no one is around to see it, does it make a deeply confusing metaphorical sound? Well, yeah, innovation doesn't need to be influenced. It doesn't need to change the norms. It just needs to not strictly adhere to them, which brings us to micro-innovations. Not every game needs to be a fundamental overhaul of concepts to be unique, and sometimes just a few small changes or differences in philosophy can be all you need to create something new and powerful. Dead Space's UI being so rooted in the world is a small decision that defines and enhances that game by a lot. It creates a simultaneously realistic and gamified world that blurs the line between gameplay and storytelling and atmosphere. Hellblade takes the overplayed idea of your character talking to themselves and turns it into a harrowing, self-doubting psychosis. This is a linear game about loss and grief with bare-bones melee combat. In its most stripped-down form, it's nothing we haven't seen before, but this one change makes it one of the most unique games I've ever played. I even think, honestly, that Elden Ring isn't all that innovative in most cases. It has the same general gameplay loop that FromSoft has been at for over 10 years. Its dungeons are clearly influenced by other games. Its NPCs are influenced by 
general household items, to me it only really innovates in one area, its side content. Its actual side quests are often convoluted and frustrating, but its side areas, its side bosses, the places you go, the sights you see, the level of imagination you'll miss out on if you don't check out this well in a random forest in the first area, it's absurd. The whole actually choose wherever you want to go concept has been done before by Breath of the Wild and Skyrim and even the aforementioned Shadow of the Colossus, but to curate and stylize it like this, create these sprawling, thoughtful levels with their own unique hazards and looks and shard bearers, the best moments of the game, the most cinematic, the downright weirdest, all hidden away and skippable actually feels new. It only really has that one major change in approach, but that one thing is all it needed and it helps that it's a pretty big thing. A lot of times these micro innovations won't really catch on, maybe some games will take small bits and pieces, but have we seen a game really expand or match Dead Space's style of UI since Dead Space itself? No, except for a couple of games that are direct Dead Space imitators. But maybe it's actually better that way, as these little details or slightly bigger decisions feel native to one project and can't be found in the same capacity anywhere else, which I think is especially the case when it comes to art. I really think we're living in a golden age of art in video games. I have no idea whose soul these artists must have sacrificed to the devil in order to come up with this stuff. We're seeing traditional Japanese art come to life, one-bit games using a unique dithering technique to simulate texture, Tim Burton-esque trips into sinister worlds, colorful dreamlike explorations of responsive environments, and it's not just how the games look, but how these teams are accomplishing those looks. The Last Night and Replaced, for example, both have their own pipelines for creating gorgeous lighting effects and simulating depth of field. And they're doing so on engines like Unity, which is a universally accessible dev engine. It's basically ground zero outside of drag and drop. Even schmucks like me have played around with it, and look how they managed to use it. These strides in visual design are constantly transforming what's possible from indie and AAA teams. Their contributions to the space are undeniable and the definition of innovative. I mean, just look at my favorite game to come out of Summer Game Fest this year. I dare you to tell me that you don't want to play this. Huh? I'm a what? In a where? I don't care. I don't even care that I have no idea how to actually play skateboarding games. I kind of don't even care if the game is good. I just want this art style burned into my retinas. I think micro innovations are a very overlooked part of truly masterful games. A lot of people like to pretend that games like The Last of Us or God of War are very textbook, and they're really not. Naughty Dog is actually an interesting company to look at for this topic because they're sort of both leaders and followers. They always create games in whatever genre is the most popular at the time, following whatever precedent is set by the industry, but they then create some of its most defined finding games. Crash Bandicoot, Jack and Daxter, Uncharted, The Last of Us, these are considered to be some of, if not the best games in their respective genres, and it's done not through their huge revolutionary ideas, but their smaller points of emphasis. Not only do they bring a lot of advancements to storytelling into the mix, including their strides in cinematography, which is light years ahead of most other studios, but then there's a huge improvements to facial animations, combat animations, environmental density, physics, set piece design. Not all of these things are 100% necessary for every game, and in some cases they do take the realism a bit too far, but this is innovation, and you can feel it as a player. It's the reason Uncharted 4 from 6 years ago looks and plays better than most games today, and probably still will once we get to the PS6. It's impossible to say what kind of game I'm going to be in the mood for next, something that feels familiar or something that feels pretty out there. Just like I can't tell you what I'll want for lunch tomorrow. I mean, even yesterday I hopped from a complete packaged AAA action game to a stylish new racing game to a fairly derivative Metroidvania to a highly imaginative Metroidvania to a genre snapping, speedrunning, FPS, visual novel dating sim in the span of six hours. The point is, no one approach is correct. These games can all exist and be appreciated, and I'm tired of this idea that we have to make fun of this game because it doesn't do anything new, or this game doesn't have a narrative because it's not laid out like it usually is. Not only is it dismissive of the new ideas and grasp on core ideas that exist in both, but you know you can still appreciate things about a game without necessarily liking them, right? You can appreciate the time and effort it takes to deliver on so many fronts in such a a polished way or appreciate new approaches to old ideas. Even if it's not what you're looking for, that doesn't make it inherently bad. That's not to say every game is great or that we have to praise everything, you can still have standards, but to reduce what games should be to a couple of bullet points is ridiculous. There are an endless number of ways that a game can be good, that a game can innovate or master existing ideas, and we should encourage all of those different approaches, including the straightforward ones, because they make the industry more three-dimensional. Or I guess don't, I mean, I don't know, I'm not your mom. <laughs>